Awesome. Thank you for the intro. Uh, so I am not nervous. I am excited. So if you look physiologically, anxiety and excitement are basically the same thing. It's all about your perception. So I'm excited. Now, some of y'all, if you know me, might be a little surprised that I'm speaking at this conference. But I'm actually really excited to be here because I'm a big believer in that if somebody reaches across the aisle, which Jeff did, uh, we should be willing to have open discourse. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, thank you. Now, I also want to point out right away, I am not anti-low carb. Some people may think that, and it's actually a logical fallacy that I'm going to discuss here called a straw man fallacy. So why am I doing this talk? Jeff asked me to do this talk I think because I maybe point these out a little bit more online than a lot of other people. And I was discussing uh, previously with someone talking about, I think when we're defending points or getting defensive, our default as humans is actually really toxic communication, to be honest. I'm guilty of this as well, okay? So I'm gonna point out some common logical fallacies that I see when discussing nutrition science. And uh, I'm going to give some actual real examples that I've heard. Some of these are verbatim. So hopefully it's educational, fun. I'm going to challenge you. I'm sure you're going to challenge me. Don't worry. I do pick on low carb a little bit here. I also pick on vegans and other diet zealot groups. So don't worry. We're going to spread the love. I promise. I didn't get any boos. I was like, hoping, I was like, I hope I get my first boo. That's, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so what are logical fallacies? These are errors in reasoning based on poor or faulty logic. I just straight up took this off Wikipedia, I'm not gonna lie, all right? So I see these a lot when talking about science, and I think a lot of what happens when we invoke logical fallacies is we aren't actually listening to what the other person is saying. We're inserting intention as well as trying to fill in gaps that possibly don't exist. Not always, but a lot of times. Whereas if we just listen to what the person said at face value, we could probably have a little bit better discourse. And again, I'm guilty of this too at times. So my favorite and by far the number one logic fallacy I see when talking about nutritional sciences is what's called a straw man fallacy. And this is where you have the impression of refuting an argument, but the real subject was actually not addressed. So for example, I'm just coming right out the gate with a right hook here. Um, <laughs> low carb diets are not superior for fat loss when compared to calorie and protein equated high carb diets. And a response I get to this might be, there's no way somebody can uh, lose weight eating as many Pop-Tarts as they want. That's actually something I have heard. And uh, I never said that, I never claimed that. If you ate unlimited Pop-Tarts, you'd overconsume calories, and yes, you would probably gain weight. So again, when it's a straw man, what you're doing is you are constructing an argument that the person didn't make, attacking that argument, giving the impression that you refuted what they said, whereas you actually never addressed the real crux of what they said. That by far is the most popular one, and it's not every group does it, whether it's vegan zealots, fasting zealots, flexible dieting zealots, I'll put my, my crew in there. The other thing I do want to point out in my defense of low carb is, uh, Corey mentioned I have a nutritional coaching app, Carbon Diet Coach, we have two, not one, but two low carb settings on the app. There is no other dietary strategy that has two settings on our app. So it's very hard to argue that I'm anti-low carb. But I still like to have fun. So uh, false dichotomy. This is probably the second most popular fallacy. And this is a fallacy based on limiting someone's options. So basically, like I might say, Sugar is not fattening, independent of the calories it provides. I actually wrote a really, really, really long article on my website about this. I also should point out, I came from a lab that skews low carb. If anybody knows Don Lehman, 
That was my PhD advisor. So I am not biased towards high carb or sugar. I just look at the data and report what the data is there. So I might say something like this, sugar's not uh, fattening independent of the calories it provides, which by the way is backed up by quite a bit of research. So somebody might say, you can't tell me someone eating a diet of 2,000 calories all from sugar is the same as somebody who eats a diet of 2,000 calories from protein. It's not the same. Also, nobody eats that way. And it's not like, why am I limited to these two choices? I, like, this is not how people eat. So you're basically providing two choices that are very extreme to try and make a point. But again, you're not addressing the original argument. By the way, I'm not advocating for sugar consumption. This is another straw man fallacy people make. If I say something like that, people say, you're pro-sugar, big food, you're paid off. I mean, I really, really, really wish I was getting big food checks because I could have flown here private. It would have made things much, much easier. Ad hominem. This, this is probably the third most popular one. Sometimes it can be the go-to default for more aggressive people. I probably fall in this category sometimes. So this is a fallacy where you're trying to undermine someone's argument by attacking the person rather than attacking the crux of the argument. So, for example, I might say something like, the most important thing for fat loss is sustaining a calorie deficit. This quote, this next quote, is directly off of a comment on my YouTube channel. You are a disgusting fat sugar addict. <laughs> that may or may not be true, but it has nothing to do with my argument, okay? I mean, disgusting, I mean fat maybe, but like disgusting, I mean that's, geez, I have feelings. <laughs> it's not true, I don't have feelings. Uh, an anecdote fallacy. This is a fallacy that uses personal experience or an isolated example instead of a sound argument. So an example might be, a carniv I might say a carnivore diet is not an optimal, balanced, healthy diet. And somebody say, well, that's not true. I lost 30 pounds with carnivore and I feel great. I say, that's great, but it's not magic and you probably could have lost that weight while still incorporating other foods. Now, I think an important thing to point out about anecdote is when I talk about anecdote, and I talk about the issues with anecdote, I'm not saying someone's personal experience isn't valid. Your personal experience is your experience. But trying to broadly apply that to others is where it becomes problematic. I was even guilty of this, okay? And I'll give you an example. So when I was in college, uh, this is circa the year 2000 to 2004, I had just gotten into competing in bodybuilding, and I was trying to do the whole eat clean, which now in some, that's a very triggering term for me because I'm like, can you objectively define what clean is? Like, do we have a bottle of Windex? Like, how's this work? So what I found was for me, I would basically eat clean all week until I would break and end up binge eating on the weekend, okay? And so instead of trying to continue to do that, I said, well, Maybe it's not like the, the one slice of pizza that's hurting me. Maybe it's the fact that I eat the whole thing when I have it. So maybe if I just, you know, accounted for the calories in the pizza, it would work out. And, you know, sure enough, I was able to be consistent and have a successful bodybuilding career, modifying my body composition based off that. And I was like, oh, this is easy. I just, I can eat the foods I like. I've just got to account for them in my macros. I can solve the obesity crisis. This is easy. Well, it turns out not everyone's like me, funny enough. Um, I've been called a robot by some, and if I decide to do something, I just do it. Uh, that tripped my compliance algorithm for whatever reason. That, that's easy for me, but it's not easy for some other people. And like I, I'll tell people when I talk about calories in and calories out, they say, well, weight loss, it can't be that simple. I'm like, well, the components of calories in and calories out actually aren't simple. But the concept is simple. But it doesn't mean that that makes an easy solution. I mean, y'all, we agree, right, generally that if you want to save money, you have to earn more than you spend. Does, does anybody disagree with that? No, right? So why isn't everybody rich? You have that knowledge, just go be rich. Well, because it's tied up in our habits and behaviors and all that kind of stuff, just like our eating is. Appeal to ridicule. 
This is, a, this is a fun. So some of these fallacies I actually didn't know existed. And as I read about them, I'm like, oh, I've seen that before. So this is a fallacy which claims an argument to be ridiculous or absurd. So basically it's just like a ha-ha. So, for example, fruits and vegetables are healthy for you. And their response might be, do I look like some vegan pansy who eats nothing but plants? I mean, you're, you're ridiculing it without addressing the argument. One thing you'll notice with all of these fallacies is there's no direct addressment of the original argument. So the response might be, whether or not vegans are pansies has no bearing on the healthfulness of fruits and vegetables. Shockingly. They are a little bit pansies, aren't they? I'm just kidding. <laughs> kidding! <laughs> kidding. Bandwagon fallacy. This is another one that I hear a lot. A fallacy where there's an appeal for popularity. Okay, so, there's a lot of stuff that gets popular that I would argue is really not great ideas. So, uh, just in nutrition, carnivore obviously works amazing. Look at how many people are doing it. Well, that doesn't really mean anything. What about all the people who do it and then don't post about it? I don't know if you guys know what selection bias is, but basically, if you like something, well, it's kind of like multifaceted, but an example of it is if you like something, you are likely to seek out uh, information chambers that also like that. So if you like carnivore or like low carb or like vegan or whatever it is, why is carnivore the best diet when you go to Google? And shockingly, Google will tell you why it's the best diet, right? So one of the problems with it is if you're in some of these Facebook groups or chat groups or whatever, and I've seen this and it doesn't matter, this applies to any nutrition group. If somebody's not getting results, first off, the first, well, you must be doing it wrong. Like, there has to be, you have to be doing it wrong. And then it's like, if they're apparently doing it right, it's like, well, you must be lying, you're cheating. You're like, you know. So people don't tend to talk about it if it's not working well for them because they feel kind of ostracized. And even if people aren't, like, bullying to a certain degree, people still don't like to feel like they're not part of the tribe. Us humans, you know, We've like advanced to a certain level, but we're also really still very dumb in some ways in the way our minds work. Burden of proof fallacy. This is one of my favorite ones in terms of the example I can use. So this is a fallacy where the claimant attempts to shift the burden of proof from themselves to the person denying the claim. So some of you all, if you listen to the Joe Brogan podcast, you might recognize this line. Some people just can't tolerate carbs. My brother could eat as much as humanly possible and not gain weight, but if I eat any carbs at all, I gain weight. Sorry, I kind of butchered the quote. Uh, that's unlikely. There's little evidence that vast genetic differences in carb tolerance explain obesity. By the way, I've got the references for my claims on these slides if you guys want to check them out. Um, and somebody said, well, you can't prove that that didn't happen. Okay, so one, I also can't prove that there's not a teacup orbiting Saturn. Right? I, can't, I can't do that. Like, I can't look at all the places on Saturn all the time to prove that there's no teacup there. But I have a relatively high degree of confidence that there's no teacup orbiting Saturn. The other one I'll use is I'm like, well, you can't prove that there's not a telepathic talking tree out in my backyard that I talk to every night. It talks back to me. Prove to me that it doesn't exist. Well, you can't disprove that. It's not a disprovable uh, claim. So if you make the claim, the onus is always on you to provide the evidence to support that claim, which is, once again, why, even in here, when I'm just talking about logical fallacies, if I make any kind of claim, there's a citation. False attribution fallacy. So this is where somebody claims sequential events as evidence that one event caused another. This is very, 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 very common, and pretty much everybody's guilty of this, myself included. Anybody out here superstitious? Anybody? So I have a friend um, who was married to a major league pitcher, and uh, he got traded to a new team, and his first uh, 16 appearances, he didn't give up any runs. He was a relief pitcher. And she said, like, the first, the first batter he faced 
I had my eyes closed and he struck him out. And so I closed my eyes every time he would throw the ball uh, for the next like six months, you know. And it's like, you're, so this is a false attribution fallacy. It's I closed my eyes, he struck the guy out, therefore me closing my eyes must help my husband pitch better, right? Now I realize that this is a really like kind of um, ridiculous comparison, but we do this in general as well, and this is one of the things I point out with people, and say, well, I did this, I did X and Y happened. And I said, okay, but did you hold A through V steady? Like, did, did you control all these other variables? Because as humans, we don't tend to just change one thing. And this happens, like, especially in nutrition, people go through, have you guys ever heard the, um, the diet honeymoon phase? You guys ever heard of that? So they actually show that when people switch diets, there's actually somewhat of like a reward response, especially if they're very like bought into the diet they're switching to. And so they're more likely, not only are they more likely to be more adherent, we see this in diet studies, adherence starts very high, you go out about a year and it's very low. So people don't just tend to change that diet. They go, oh, well, I'm starting this new diet, so now I'm going to go to the gym, and now I'm going to get my steps in, and I'm going to do... So, yeah, the diet may have helped, but you have all these other variables that you've changed that makes it difficult to tease apart this stuff, which is one of the real limitations when doing nutritional science research because what, you know, what are the gold standards for research? It's randomized control trials. Well, the problem is if you're looking at things like metabolic disease, heart disease, cancer, I mean, you really need like a decade of, you know, of people doing different things to see differences in those diseases. We can't do a 10-year randomized control trial. <laughs> you know, when people, when people like uh, ask me like, well, why didn't they do this in the study? Why didn't they measure that? Money, 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 and money. I know, shocking. Um, you know, just to do like a metabolic ward trial, I'm not familiar with exactly how much it costs, but a four-week trial with like, I don't know, half dozen people is probably well, well, well into the mid-six figures. It's very, very expensive. And, I don't know if you guys know this, people don't like being told what to do. And they don't just volunteer to like put their life on hold for, I don't know, 10 years, you know? So NASA did a study... Um, I don't know if they finished it, but they were recruiting a while back, and the study was they were going to pay $18,000 for 70 days. So you can make 18 grand just for being in the study for 70 days. And the study was you have to lay in bed and never get up because <laughs> they're, they're, they were testing the effects of unloading. So, well, why, why do they got to pay them? Well, I tell you what, you know, staying in bed for 70 days may sound appealing, but I think after like day three, I'm going to be like, yeah, I'm ready to get up. So when you start to try and exert these levels of control over people, it's very difficult. So what are we left with for a lot of the long-term data are things like our best bet is basically cohort studies where we're looking at, okay, what did this group do over here versus this group over here over the last 10 years and who got more sick, right? It's good data. It's important. But the problem is, People don't just do one thing, right? So this is, I always use this example of, you know, the correlation between red meat and cancer. First off, it's not a consistent correlation. And the second thing is, people who eat higher levels of red meat, when you eat more of something, you tend to exchange it for something else. So people who eat higher levels of red meat tend to eat less fiber, they tend to eat less fruits and vegetables, they tend to have overall lower diet quality and also because most of it is coming from, like, say, unpro or processed sources. So there was a really nice study in uh, Canada back in 2020, I think it was, where they looked at not just intakes of red meat, but also intakes of fruits and vegetables, and they found that at low levels of fruit and vegetable intake, red meat did have an association with cancer, but at high levels of fruit and vegetable intake, there was no association with cancer. So that points to, to me, what that says is this is less about red meat causing cancer, more about the fact that people who tend to eat higher levels of red meat probably have lower overall diet quality, okay? So my point being, 
it's difficult to separate these things out. So when you go back to something, I did this and this thing happened, therefore one must have caused the other, my response is, mm, maybe. <laughs> so an example would be, you don't have to do a low-carb diet. See, I told you I was coming left with right and left hooks today. Uh, you don't have to do a low-carb diet to lose weight. And somebody says, that's not true. When I cut out carbs, I started losing weight. Sure, okay. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the carbs themselves are the cause of your weight loss. When you reduced carbs, you also reduced your caloric intake. Most people find a low-carb diet more satiating. All right. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Again, I didn't know that this existed, but then when I saw the definition, I'm like, ooh, I've seen this before. So it's a fallacy where a person chooses a pattern of data they can apply a presumption to. So for example, the EU has banned cultivation of GMOs, thus GMOs are bad. My response is, what about all the other countries that haven't banned them? And I don't know if you guys know this, Government is made up of what? Anybody want to take a guess? Anybody said people? You're right. It's made up of people. You know what people do? Dumb stuff. Dumb stuff. I always say, like, I remember a while back, um, people, because I was very involved in online nutrition coaching for a long time, was very successful at it, and I used to hate some of the really bad advice that coaches were giving out that I would see harm people. And somebody said, you know, we need the government to step in and regulate this. I'm like, whoo, ho, ho, chill, because you're now saying that you trust the people in government to know who an expert is more than a regular person. Okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe, okay? People in government are just people, and so, one of the things I'll always say when somebody said, well, the, you know the state of California has banned this? I'm like, did you know that the weight plates that are in my home gym have a Prop 65 sticker on them that say, this substance is known to cause cancer in the state of California? Well, thank God I'm not going to be, you know, taking a bite out of my 45-pound plates. So, again, you have to be very careful when picking out something like that and assuming, oh, this country banned this, therefore it must be bad. Well, what about all the things their country hasn't banned? Are you saying everything they haven't banned is now good? You know, like, so you've got to think about this clearly and realize that whenever you use one of these logical fallacies, somebody has, as you've now opened the door for the other person to turn around and do it right back to you, okay? Which usually results in Twitter debates which, you know, are very, very productive, especially when I'm involved. <laughs> uh, appeal to authority fallacy. This makes the appeal that if one credible source believes something, it must be true. There's no evidence that carbohydrates are inherently fattening, independent of their energy content. Appeal to authority. Well, Dr. Donnie Darko, sorry, I'm throwing it back to my, you know, millennial babies. Uh, claims that refined carbohydrates are the cause of obesity, and he's a researcher at Harvard. Okay, well, the evidence still doesn't support his claims, and there are other researchers at prestigious universities that disagree with him. So one of the problems with anecdote or appeals to authority is how do you decide whose anecdote has, has more value than the other person's? What makes your anecdote better than mine, or your anecdote better than hers? I mean, this is like the bro bodybuilders from back in the day. It's like, well, I'm more jacked than you, so therefore I know more. I'm like, okay, so therefore Ronnie Coleman is the greatest scientist in the history of mankind? Like, <laughs> Appeal to nature fallacy. This one's very popular. Here you go. I have a slide where I make fun of vegans. You guys are welcome. Thank me later refers to a fallacy that claims because something occurs in nature, it must be justified as superior. Cue the game changers. We evolved on a plant-based diet, therefore we should all be vegan. Uh, there's considerable debate about what we evolved on, and even so, what we evolved on, doesn't necessarily mean that's the optimal current method to achieve better health, okay? Our ancestors tended to eat whatever the hell they could find. <laughs> 
you know, I don't think, you know, if they're, I always tell this to vegans, I'll be like, do you really think if there's just an animal right there that they're going to be like, mm, nope, my body isn't right made for that. And same thing, you know, if, if you're a carnivore advocate or, or a low carb advocate, if you have, here's all this honey and fruit, <laughs> nope, 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 going to spike my insulin. No true Scotsman, this was another one that I learned about that I didn't know existed, appeals to the purity of an idea as a way to dismiss criticism. So, increased consumption of fiber is associated with decreased mortality. A no true Scotsman response would be, no real primal would subsist on plants. You've created an ideal primal that is not relevant to the data being discussed. Okay. I'll stop picking on Brian. He's had enough people pick on him over the last six months. Uh, this one is a very popular one as well. It's kind of along the same lines as a straw man, but a little bit different. So a red herring fallacy focuses on arguing for an irrelevant, bless you, topic with the intention of, distract, of distracting the audience. This usually happens when the orator, or the person making the claim, finds another topic easier to outline. So, for example, I might say fruit and vegetable consumption is associated with decreased body weight and increased satiety. Red, Harris, red herring response might be, that doesn't matter. Look at pandas. They eat nothing but plants and look how fat they are. Which the reverse of that would be like in the Game Changers documentary. They're like, but look how jacked gorillas are. Refutation, pandas have nothing to do with this conversation. They are cute, though. Slippery slope fallacy, a fallacy that consists of assumption that if A occurs, B will occur, which will lead to C, and so on and so forth. So here's, a, here's one. If I start working out, I'll get sore. If I get sore, I won't be able to run away from an attacker, and I'll get robbed. And I'll just, you know, anything like that with a slippery slope, I'll just say, well, that's making a lot of assumptions. All right, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I could take one or a few, or we could move on. Yes, sir. Later? Okay, perfect. All right. Well, that's all I got. I hope you guys liked it, and I appreciate you. Let me pick on you a little bit.